So years ago, Oprah was talking to a group of students at Stanford, and she's talking to them about her life and career and, and leadership and these kinds of things. And, and I found one of the things that she said pretty interesting. Uh, she said in all the interviews that she's ever done, she said, uh, everybody always asks her the same question. They asked the same question. She said, when the interview's over, the camera stopped rolling, she said, without fail, the first thing that everyone wants to know is this. Was that okay? How'd I do? Was it good enough? She said, it didn't matter who, who it was. It didn't matter who she was interviewing. She said she talked to people who were you know, in prison, uh, facing life sentences. She said she talked to celebrities, influencers, current and former presidents of the United States. She said it didn't matter who you were, what you'd done, what you were going to do, what you were doing. She said that question was kind of the common denominator that, that linked all of these interviews. I looked the other day. She's done something like 35,000 interviews in her career, which is Crazy to me. 35,000 interviews, and every single person wants to know, was that okay? And I, th- I think on the surface, right, that, that makes a lot of sense. On the surface, this question makes a lot. If you and I were to sit down with Oprah for an interview, that would probably be one of the first things that comes out of our mouths, too. Did I, did I look silly, or did I do okay? But I also think that there's something deeper to this question. I think there's something underneath it. I think there's something more. And I think that the question that they're really asking is this, am I enough? Not just is is what I said enough, but am I enough? And I think it's human nature to ask that question. I think it's human nature. I think all of us, to some extent, we, we wonder whether or not that's true, right? It's not just the 35,000 plus people that Oprah has interviewed. It's, it's all of us. We all have that question. We all have that experience. We all have that feeling. And I think part of why we ask this question is because if we're really honest, we have this nagging sense that we're not. We have the nagging sense that the answer is no, and so we ask this question because a lot of us, a lot of the time, we feel like this, I'm not enough. I'm not blank enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not attractive enough. I'm not healthy enough. I'm not accomplished enough. I'm not successful enough. I'm just not good enough. My kids are struggling. I must not be a good enough parent my marriage isn't going the way that I expected it to, and so I must not be a good enough spouse. It seems like all my coworkers always get praise, and, and, and I don't. I must not be good enough at what I do. Halfway through the semester, my grades aren't where I wanted them to be. I'm not a good enough student. My friendships aren't going the way that I thought they'd go. I must not be a good, I mean, on and on and on, right? Like, you get the point. You can change whatever you put before enough. You can change whatever word you want to put in that blank, It doesn't matter. The feeling is still the same. It's this feeling that we don't measure up. It's this feeling that we're somehow inadequate. It's this feeling that I'm not enough. We've all felt that, right? And to be sure, people throughout the Bible felt that way too. Thousands of years ago, people, real people living real lives with the same questions, the same struggles, the same doubts and insecurities, including this insecurity, this question that we're asking, am I enough? And so let's look at some examples. Let's start with Moses. So here's the scene. In the book of Exodus, God's people, the Israelites, they're enslaved in Egypt. They're under the oppression of Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and the Israelites rightly cry out to God. And they say, God, do something about this. And God hears their prayer and says, okay, I will. And this is what he says to Moses in Exodus 3, picking up in verse 7. He says, the Lord Lord said to Moses, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So now go, Moses, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. Now, you would think that this would be good news, 
You would think that it would be good news that that God has a plan to get Israel out of enslavement in Egypt and that God saying to Moses, I'm going to send you to talk to Pharaoh to say, let my people go, that that would be good news to him. Except this is how he responds. Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? God, like, are you sure you want me to do it? Are you sure? Who am I? And God says, yeah, no, I want you to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. But Moses isn't done because a chapter later he says this. He says, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. So you just hear his sense of insecurity, right? You you hear this sense of of inadequacy. Moses is saying to God, he's saying, who am I, God? I'm not good enough to go to Pharaoh. I don't speak well enough. Surely you don't want me to go to Pharaoh. Or how about Gideon in the book of Judges? Israel is in kind of a similar situation. They're under the oppression of a people group. This time it's the Midianites and the Israelites, they cry out to God again, and, and, and God answers that prayer, and he sends an angel to have a conversation with Gideon, and this is what the angel says to Gideon, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Now, again, good news, right? God's going to do something about Israel's enslavement. He's going to send Gideon to Midian to overthrow them so that Israel can go, except this is how Gideon responds, pardon me, my Lord, but how can I save Israel? My clan's the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. So he's talking to an angel sent by God, and he says, I I, I think you got it. I don't think that you really mean to send me. I'm not strong enough. I I can't. Certainly, you don't want to send me to the Midianites. My clan's the weakest, my family, I'm the least in my family, surely not me. And then there's Jeremiah in the book, first book of, first chapter of the book of Jeremiah, words are hard. Uh, God says this to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born again, before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So God says to Jeremiah, I formed you, I knew you, I set you apart, Why? to be a prophet to the nations. See, God has a purpose clearly laid out for Jeremiah. He says, this is your purpose, to go to the nations. I formed you, I knew you, I set you apart for this very purpose that you will go and speak of me. But this is what Jeremiah says in response. Alas, sovereign Lord, I know you're in control, but I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. God says, I'm gonna, I've set you apart to be a prophet. And Jeremiah says, no, 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 not me. I don't know how to speak. I, I don't, I'm not experienced enough. Last one, we need to go to the New Testament. So let's go to the Gospel of Mark. Here's the scene. Uh, Jesus is on his way to the house of a little girl. She's sick, she's dying. Her father has come to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, please do something. If you don't come, uh, she's going to die. And so Jesus says, okay, let's go. And so they are on their way to this little girl's house. And as this is happening, crowds are kind of surrounding them. People are starting, this is a time in Jesus' ministry where people are starting to pay attention to what Jesus is doing, what he's saying. And so lots of crowds were told, lots of people pressing in on Jesus and his father as they head toward this house. And the interesting thing about this story is right in the middle of it, Mark introduces us to a new character. It's someone completely unrelated to the father, completely unrelated to the daughter. It's a woman. And what we're told about the woman is that she's been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She's seen all the doctors there is to see. She's used all the resources that she has. She spent all the money that she has to help fight this problem, but it's not getting any better. In fact, to make matters worse, we don't have time to get into it, but At the time, because of Jewish law, she was known as being ceremonially unclean. Which may be another way of just saying that is that because of that, she was an outcast to society. She was untouchable. She was 
isolated for 12 years, couldn't have normal relationships like everyone else, certainly couldn't talk to Jesus face to face, so she thought, and so she does this, Mark 5, 27. She came up behind Jesus in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. I'm unclean. I'm unacceptable. I I can't have normal face-to-face conversations. And so she's got to weasel through a crowd. And so let's just summarize for a second what we just saw. This is what we saw. We saw that, that Moses wasn't good enough. Gideon wasn't strong enough. Jeremiah wasn't experienced enough. The woman wasn't acceptable enough. See, you can change the word, right? I said this earlier. You can change the word. You can put whatever word before the word enough that you want, but the feeling is the same. I'm just not enough. They feel it. We feel it. All the people that Oprah has interviewed feel it. And so the question then becomes, What do we do with that? What do we do with that feeling? What do we do with that sense of inadequacy? What do we do with with feeling like we don't measure up? What do we do with that sense that I'm just not enough? Well, one option is to kind of spiral into this comparison. We look out and we see other people or where we want to be or who we wish we were. And all that comparison, what does it do? It makes us discontent. And that discontentment over time, it turns into despair. And so one option is to compare, to be discontent, to despair. Another option is, is what I'm gonna call the, the Rachel Hollis response. Now, if you don't know who Rachel Hollis is, that's fine. She's uh, certainly not a perfect person, uh, but she is very impressive, a few years ago, Anna Lynn Fraser, one of our staff members, wrote a blog for a church, and she summarizes a lot of what makes Rachel Hollis so impressive. This is what she said. It's a little long, but it's good. She said, Rachel Hollis overcame a dysfunctional family, her brother's suicide and an eating disorder. She started a high-level event planning business in L.A. with only a high school education, then another business, Chic Media, that has grown to be a multi-million dollar company. She's given birth to three boys, was a foster parent for a while, and eventually adopted a little girl. She boxes, runs marathons, lost a lot of weight, and has since kept it off. She drinks half her body weight and ounces of water every day, kicked her addiction to Diet Coke. She gets eight hours of sleep a night, wakes up at 5 a.m., meditates, eats a healthy breakfast, journals her goals all before the kids get up. She's published five books, is a New York Times bestselling author, Travels all over the country for speaking engagements, book promotions. She organizes a massive conference called Rise, and she has millions of followers on social media. And we're left wondering what we do with our lives, yeah? And maybe also a little tired. See, the reason, though, that, I show, or that, that we read that is because in many ways it, it sets up how Rachel Hollis approaches life. It sets up her framework for life. Because on the first page of one of her books, she writes this. She says, you and only you, you and only you are ultimately responsible for who you become and how happy you are. You and only you are ultimately responsible for who you become and how happy you are. And so what she's saying here in in other places, other things she's written, she's saying, look, all this stuff about not being enough all this, this feeling of of being inadequate, like that we're not enough, she says, it's a lie. It's, it's, it's toxic self-talk. Don't believe the lie. She says, just work harder. Just work harder because you're in control. It's up to you. If you want to be happy, work harder, you'll be happy. If you want to be enough, do more so that you feel like you're enough. Don't despair. Work harder. Do more. Say more. That's the path for us to feel like we're enough. And when we go down that path, she says, we can, we can look out and say, hey, look at, look at my life. Look at all the things that I've done. Look at all the things that I'm doing. Look at all the, the things that I'm going to do. Now, now, maybe you're thinking, well, that approach doesn't seem too bad, yeah? Like if one option is, is to compare and, and to get stuck in kind of comparison and discontentment and despair, if the other option is just to work really hard, Well, yeah, I'll take that. 
If I could just work hard, if I could just try hard, if I could just do more, then I can eventually become enough, then I, yeah, I kind of want that. Here's a question, though. Here's a question. If we're enough, do we even need Jesus? If we're enough, do we even need Jesus? If you can, if I can, if we can just work harder, if we can just do more, do we really need Jesus? Not so much, do we? See, Rachel Hollis says that this is the truth. She says that, that you and only you are ultimately responsible for who you become and how happy you are. But here's the irony of this. The irony of this is that this is a version of the very lie that the serpent said to the man and the woman in the Garden of Eden. It's a version of the same lie that the serpent said to the man and the woman in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, verse 4. Here's the context. God has spoken to the man and the woman, and he said, hey, you can do all these things. Just don't eat of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, because if you do, you'll die. The serpent comes along and says, nah, no, you won't. You won't certainly die. For God just knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And so what the serpent says to the woman and, and the man is, is that, that you don't need God. You don't need God. Just do whatever you want. right? Your happiness is up to you. It's up to you. You're, you can be in control. Just choose to live however you want. That's, if you want to be enough, then just do whatever. And it sounded pretty good. And that tree probably looked pretty good. And that fruit looked pretty good. And so what do the man and the woman do? They, they eat. And what happens as a result of their rebellion, which, by the way, our culture calls freedom, but the Bible calls that disobedience rebellion, what happens? Sin and death and destruction come into the world, not just the world, their lives, which is exactly what the enemy wanted, yeah? It's exactly what the enemy wanted. That's what he wanted in their life, and, and to be honest, it's what he wants in your life, in my life, in our lives too. He wants to deceive us. He wants to trick you into thinking that you can be enough apart from God. He wants to trick you into thinking that you can be enough apart from God, that if you believe that, and maybe more importantly, if you live that out, He wants to deceive you into believing that because he knows that if you believe it, if you live it out, here's what's gonna happen. Eventually, one way or another, it's going to destroy you. We might not feel that now, but one day it's going to turn life upside down. And so I I say this with empathy, not with judgment at all, because I've... I know what this is like, and in many ways, I I still feel it, I still experience it. I'm kind of feeling it right now, like having to prove myself in front of a bunch of people. I know that some of us right now, we're here this morning, and this is exactly where we're at. We're in this space of believing that we can be enough apart from God, that that we've just got to do more. I've just got to climb the ladder, I've got to work harder, and then I'll finally be enough. But really, if we're honest with ourselves, all that's done is is thrown us into this endless cycle. It really is endless, isn't it? It's an endless cycle of, of trying and trying and trying to prove to ourselves and to other people that we're actually enough. So that that feeling that we all feel finally goes away. Is that you? Is that where you're at this morning? Or maybe to ask it differently, what are we, me, you, what are we all, what are we doing in our lives to, to, to try to be enough apart from God? What are you doing how are you trying to kind of make that feeling of, of not being enough go away? See, what I think God is saying to us this morning is that apart from him, it never will. Apart from him, that feeling, it's not going to go away. It never does. Which is also why God has a better answer. God has a better answer. He's got a better way. He's got a better identity. It's an identity built not on what we do, but on whose we are. 
God has a better identity for you and I than, than being stuck in despair or, or, or being caught up in this kind of performance trap. He's got a better identity. He says it's an identity built not on what you do. It's not what you do. It's whose you are. And so let's go back to those characters that we looked at in the Bible earlier because, to be honest, I didn't give you the full story. But remember Moses. Moses said, I'm not good enough. I shouldn't go to Pharaoh. This is how God responds to him. Exodus 3.12, he says, yeah, but I'll be with you. I'm not good enough to go to Pharaoh. I, you, should, you don't want to say, God says, yeah, I'll be with you. He says, okay, but, but I don't talk very well. I don't speak very well. Something wrong with my mouth. And God says this, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and teach you what to say. See, Moses says, I'm not good enough. I, 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 I don't know how to speak very well. And God says, it's okay, because I'm with you. I'm with you. Gideon, same thing. The weakest in all of Manasseh, the least in my family, not strong enough to go to the Midianites. And God says the same thing. Judges 6, 16. Yeah, but I'll be with you. You're not strong enough, Gideon. But I am. And I'm going to be with you. Remember Jeremiah? He said he was too young, too inexperienced. Well, this is what God said to him. The Lord said to me, do not say I'm too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I'm with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Don't be afraid. You're not too young. You're not too inexperienced. I'm going to be with you, God says to Jeremiah. Or how about the woman? I mean, you, you can't hear that story and your heart not break, yeah? I mean, just imagine. Imagine being in her shoes. Imagine being untouchable for 12 years. 12 years, more than a decade and counting. Untouchable, unacceptable, unclean. You gotta weasel through a crowd just to clip the corner of Jesus' cloak. That's what she does. And when Jesus realizes that's what she's done, this is what he says to her. Jesus said to her, he said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. See, that woman, she's unclean to society, but not to Jesus. She's unacceptable to other people, but not to Jesus. And not only does Jesus heal her, one of the fascinating things about this, at least as I read it, is in this crowd of people. Remember, people all around. And Jesus looks at her, and you gotta just think for a second how Jesus must have looked at her that day. He looks right at her in the sea of people. It's probably the most attention that she's had in 12 years. Jesus is looking right at her and only her. He's not concerned with other people. He's looking at her. And what does he say to her? He says, daughter, daughter, now, I'm unclean. No, 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 you're my daughter. I I'm unacceptable. No, 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 you're my daughter. You're my daughter. See, it's not what you do, it's whose you are. It's not what you do, it's whose you are. Are. See, in all of these instances, and there are many, many more that we don't have time to get into, in all of these instances, in response to this, this feeling that they had, that I'm not enough, God says, you don't have to be, because I am, and I'm with you. It's not what you do, it's whose you are. And so we read this in 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. See, what these verses mean is that we can get off that hamster wheel. We can get off the hamster wheel of, of trying and trying and trying to, to do more, to, to prove to ourselves, to prove to other people that we're enough. 
gosh, it's exhausting, isn't it? Isn't it so exhausting living on that hamster wheel of, of trying and trying and trying to prove ourselves? He says, you can get off that. You can get off that hamster wheel on what? You can rest confidently, securely in who God says you are, in, in whose you are. A son, a daughter, an heir to an inheritance that will never perish, never spoil, never fail. See, here's the reality this morning. You and I, we're not enough. We're not enough. You're not enough. I'm not enough. But here's the good news. You don't have to be. Because if your faith is in Jesus, Jesus is enough on your behalf through his life and death and resurrection. And he promises us, and oh, so good of a promise it is. He promises you to be with you forever. Let that define you. It's not what you do. It's whose you are. Amen.